watching Shalom TV, celebrating Jewish culture. Aleph, Bet, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, Hey, Bob, Sein, Chet, Tet, Yud, Kof, Chof, Lamed, Mel, Yon, Samech, Ayin, Pei, Fei, Tzadi, Kuf, Reish, Shin, Sin, Tov, Now I think I've said enough. Welcome to another lesson in our series, From the Aleph Bet, a series for anyone of any age who wishes to learn how to read and understand Hebrew, especially the Hebrew that's used in the experience of Judaism here in the United States. I'm Mark Golub. It is always wonderful to be with you again. And I can't tell you what lovely emails I've received since our last program which dealt with the Hebrew for the proper name of God, I got some of the loveliest emails. And Lynn from Gloucester, Mass. I mean, you should write me every day. It's just, your words are so inspiring to me. Thank you. And Jim from Chico, California. And Suzanne from Brentwood, Tennessee. And Shirley from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And Linda from Seattle. And Rochelle and Jeff, a rabbi from Gig Harbor in the state of Washington. But you, you think about all the places we're being seen all over the United States. That itself is thrilling for me. But all of you, and many, many more I can't mention right now, all of you who've written to me, I can't thank you enough. Please keep writing, and we'll all do the very best we can to provide you with really informative, and uh, what shall I say, programs that have insight into the Jewish tradition as well as learning Hebrew. But thank you all of you who've written to me. So I want to continue to learn how to pronounce words in Hebrew, giving you a chance to really see words on the screen and see if you can pronounce these words. And more important, to try to give you a sense of what these words mean so that you understand Hebrew as you actually read it. And that's what reading is. Most of us who grew up in the Talmud Torah Hebrew school system, we learned how to pronounce Hebrew, but not how to read it. Hebrew is a language. And understanding Hebrew does not necessarily mean a literal translation from one word to another. In fact, translation is rarely literal once you get past simple nouns. I mean, table, okay, shulchan, chair, kisei, window, chalon. Those are easy. But once you get past easy nouns, it's very difficult to do literal translation. And I was taught literal translation when I was in high school, when I was in Talmud Torah. And very often, if I tried to translate from one language to another, my translation made no sense to individuals who were native in the language I was trying to translate into. Because what translation really means is trying to express in one's own language what this other language is, to, is trying to express at the same time. And most language is not literal translation. Most language is idiomatic. And the trick then is to understand what idiom in one's own language best expresses the idiom in this other language. What do we say in English, which is the equivalent of what an Israeli or a Hebrew-speaking individual would say in Hebrew? That goes for Hebrew, for French, for Spanish, for Russian. It's the idiom that's critical. And I'll give you a simple example. We all understand this, but let me give you a simple example. In English, we meet somebody. What do we say to them? We say, hi, how are you? How are you? The question is, how would you say that in Hebrew? In Hebrew, that phrase is, you can see it here on the screen, ma shlom cha. Some of you have asked for conversational Hebrew. We're not really doing conversational Hebrew on from the Aleph Bet, but here's how in conversation a modern Israeli would say, how are you, would greet another person. They would say, ma shlom cha. And you know, by the way, these words already. It's not simply that you can read them, you understand them. You've learned already from the Aleph Bet, the word ma means how or what. 
And shalomcha obviously comes from the word shalom. And the cha suffix at the end of the word is the possessive pronoun your, second person possessive. So ma shalomcha literally means how is your peace? And since the word peace comes from the word whole or complete, you're really saying to somebody, how is your wholeness? How is your peacefulness inside you? It's not the same quite as how are you? And if you tried to do it literally, it wouldn't work. What Mashlomcha expresses is the way the Jew says to somebody, I'm happy to meet you and I want to know how you're doing. And then there's one of my favorite idioms. In English, somebody does something extraordinary. We go up to them and we say, that was out of this world. That was out of this world. Now I want to say out of this world. I want to express that idea in Hebrew. I can't use the word, word world in Hebrew. That's not the way the Hebrew idiom expresses the same idea. In Hebrew, here's how you would express the idea out of this world. Yotze is the first word. Min is the second. Ha-klau. Yotze min ha If you wanted to say somebody, what you did was extraordinary, you would say that was Yotze min ha And Yotze min ha means literally, it goes out from the general. Yotze to go out, min from ha the general. Somebody does something wonderful, it means you've done something beyond the general or the ordinary. Out of this world, Yotze min ha Two idioms, one in English, one in Hebrew, that express the same idea. And that's what translation is really about. I wish I was taught that as a young person in high school and in college. And many of us who learn Hebrew in Hebrew school, even in day schools, very often this is not the way translation is, is explained. But this is what it means to be able to speak and think in one language and then be able to speak and think in another language. And what we try to do to you, what we try to do for you here on from the Aleph Bet is give you a sense of what the Hebrew is trying to convey and how Hebrew tries to say what English says, but in a different, um, in its own language. I also want to point out to you that I don't ask you to create Hebrew in From the Aleph Bet. I don't say to you, can you write or can you come up with the word for whatever, bread. What is important to me is for you to see the word lechem and know that every time you see the word lechem, it means this, bread. Or I wouldn't ask you, what's the word for king? What I would ask of you is, when you see this word, melech, what does it mean to you? And hopefully, it means what this picture shows, something to do with a king. And here's an even better symbol for the word melech. This is the symbol of sovereignty ruling, the majesty of a ruler. And in some way, the word melech, which comes from the root mem, lamed, chaf, always has something to do with sovereignty and the idea of ruling, a ruler. And again, as we practice with you reading Hebrew, by which I mean pronouncing Hebrew and understanding Hebrew, I hope as we go along, this will become more and more second nature to you. So let's begin now with the Hebrew that's used in the experience of Judaism here in America. And I want to begin with an aspect of Jewish experience, which for many Jews, if not for most Jews, is one of the first aspects of Hebrew we learn. And that is basic Jewish blessings. Very often the first thing children are taught, by the way, is the Shema. And we did that last week. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, 
Adonai Echad, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. Adonai our God, Adonai is one, and the Shema is the most important single line recited by a Jew. It's to be recited every evening when one goes to sleep, every morning when one wakes. It's in the liturgy three times every day. And the Shema is also what many Jews say if they believe they're at the last moments of their life. It is the last thing a Jew says. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. And it's often the very first thing children are taught because the Shema is the essence of Jewish identity. The Shema has a great deal of meaning in addition, but as a statement, it's a statement of Jewish identity. And so the Shema is the first thing we often teach our children. But after teaching them the Shema, the next thing children learn, and the next thing that's the most basic aspect of living Judaism, is blessings. Blessings over bread, blessings over wine, the blessing over the Friday night candles, uh, the blessing over Hanukkah candles, when one lights the menorah or the Hanukkah, or a wonderful blessing called the Shehecheyanu, which is the blessing Jews say on any happy or joyous occasion, the Shehecheyanu. And you should also know, in the Jewish tradition, reciting blessings is so much at the core of the Jewish understanding of life. There's a saying that a Jew should recite 100 blessings every single day over everything one sees and hears and eats and drinks. The Jewish tradition teaches we should be looking for opportunities to say blessings. Why? The Jewish tradition understands that one of the biggest mistakes people make is that we tend to take life for granted. That very often the joy of life, the wonder of life, the awe-inspiring nature of life often is just sort of forgotten, unseen. All of us tend to be A, so busy in life, so distracted in life, that very often we can miss the wonder, the miracle of life, not only in the grandeur of nature, but also in the splendor of the people we love and of all we have in life, the sustenance we have, the ability to live in a free country, the ability to have close friends, and the ability to live in a situation where many of us are surrounded by people who love us and give us the opportunity to be enriched by them. We also are, again, we live in a land of plenty. And very often the plenty we have is not only overlooked, it never seems to be enough. We take for granted what we have. And the Jewish tradition reminds us that by going out of one's way to notice everything of beauty that we see and hear, everything we eat and drink, it's all symbolic, obviously. The Jewish tradition says you go out of your way even to bless difficult moments in life. One goes out of one's way every day to find things in life, to say, oh, that's so wonderful. And then there's a Jewish blessing, a Jewish way to express one's joy. And as we go on in our series from the Aleph Bet, we'll be studying one of the most beautiful lines that a Jew says upon awakening every morning. Again, why does a Jew say a blessing in the morning? Because one wants to appreciate there's another day of life. And a blessing is always expressed in terms of the essence of what the Jewish tradition believes is the ground of being. It said, blessing Adonai. That's the Jewish mentality. And it almost doesn't matter whether one believes in a literal Adonai or whether it's figurative and symbolic. What it does for the individual is create a link to the Jewish people because it's said as a Jewish blessing. And it also gives one a sense of it's special. I'm so glad I have another day of life. I'm so glad I have bread to eat. 
I'm so glad that I'm together with my family on Hanukkah with my children, my grandchildren, lighting the Hanukkah, the menorah of uh, Hanukkah. I'm so glad that it's a blessing when one hears the call of the shofar on uh, Rosh Hashanah. It's a blessing to be able to have a sukkah to go into, to wave the lulav and the etrog on the holiday of Sukkot, and on and on and on and on. The Jewish tradition understands that by our going out of our way to find things to bless in life, we are giving our own life meaning. And now the understanding that I want you to have is, what does the Hebrew convey in Jewish blessings? Most of us know blessings by rote. We've heard it said by our parents and our grandparents, often the way we recite the Hebrew, very often, is, you know, it's got the accent of our parents or our grandparents. The accent, by the way, doesn't matter whether it's right or wrong. We're going to show you the way the words are actually written. But, but in reality, any way you say a blessing is correct. But the Hebrew conveys very special ideas, very special mindset which is the Jewish mindset. And that's why it's not simply interesting to look at blessings because one wants to know, what do you say when you eat a piece of bread? But because the blessing itself conveys Jewish values. And that's the exciting part of learning Hebrew, in addition just to the fun. And many of you have expressed this to me in your emails. It's just fun for you now to open up a Siddur or see Hebrew written somewhere and you can pronounce the Hebrew. I got an email where somebody said, I saw Hebrew on a bumper sticker and I could read it. Thank you. Yeah, it's really, it's fun. All of a sudden, it's not just, you know, uh, hieroglyphics. Hebrew is not simply letters that look like uh, strange symbols but they're actually letters that make sounds and you put the sounds together and you get words. And then what I want for you is that these words have meaning. So with that said, we're looking now at what does Hebrew do with blessings? And virtually all Jewish blessings tend to fall into one of two forms, a short form and a long form. And I wanna begin with the short form blessing. And what I want to do first is put the blessing up on the screen for you. Thank you, Sloan. This is the actual Hebrew opening, the beginning of every blessing in the short form. Let's look at this blessing and see if you can both pronounce each word and then understand not what each word is saying, but what the Hebrew idea behind the word, of the word, is expressing what the Hebrew words are trying to convey. And you know this Hebrew, and I'll say it just once for you, then we'll, we'll take it word by word. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam. There are those of you who've heard that all your life. One more time. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam. That is the beginning of what's called the short form Hebrew blessing. And again, by understanding the Hebrew, I believe you're going to now get a much more profound understanding of what the Hebrew is trying to convey and what it really means, a far deeper appreciation for what you're saying anytime you recite a Jewish blessing. So I want to put a word up on the screen and see if you can read this word. This is word number one for you on this lesson of From the Aleph Bet. Notice how many vowels are in this word. And if you say one, you are correct. Remember, under the Aleph, there is a Shva. It's called a Chataf Patach because there is a Patach next to the Shva. But remember, a Shva is never counted as a vowel. So therefore, there's only one vowel in this word. It's under the Nun. It is the Hirik the E sound in Hebrew. Can you read this one syllable word? And if you read it, Ani, and again, it's one syllable. The A ah is like a grace note. Ani, not Ani, ah, but Ani. Ani, and this is a pronoun, and this pronoun means 
I. Ani in Hebrew is the word for I. Anyone who points to themselves to mean I, the word is Ani. Ani. Now let's take a look at this pronoun. Take a look at this pronoun. It has two vowels, two syllables. It's a very simple Hebrew word to read. The first syllable is a. The second syllable is ta. You put the word together, you get ata. Mitsuyan, ata. And now, if ani means, ata means, ani ata. Ani ata. Ata ani. I, you. Ata is the Hebrew word for you, the pronoun second person singular, you. Ata. It's also masculine, but in general, ata is the word for you. Incidentally, in older English, it is translated as thou, thou also being the second person singular pronoun thou so very often in prayer books ata will be translated as thou now i want to show you a three letter root remember most hebrew words are based on three letter roots take a look at this three letter root bet resh chaf whenever you see bet resh chaf in this order it has something to do with blessing. Bet, Reish, Chaf always has something to do with blessing. By the way, something very, very interesting. In Hebrew, the word blessing comes from the Hebrew word well, meaning water. And the idea is that in the ancient Near East, the real blessing of life was water. Without water, there was no life. And therefore, the word for blessing was related to the word well, water. And it tells one right away what sense the Hebrew is trying to convey when it uses the word baruch. We translate it as blessed, blessing. But it is a much more profound word. It is giver of life the most wonderful thing that sustains life. That's the origin of the Hebrew word for blessing. And a blessing, therefore, has to do with recognizing God as the source of life. Very interesting. Take a look at this word. How many vowels in this word? If you said two, you are correct. Two vowels, two syllables is the first shva under the bet, pronounced or silent. If you said pronounced, you're correct. It's under the first letter of a word. It's also under the letter with a dagesh in it. So the first syllable is berei, mitsuyan. And the second syllable, cha. Put the word together and you get brecha, brecha. Notice the root of brecha is the same root, bet, resh, Chaf. But the word brecha in Hebrew means a pool of water or a pond. Again, the idea in Hebrew is that there's a link between the idea of blessing and life-sustaining, life-giving water. And if we simply change the vowels in the word brecha to the word bracha, you get the Hebrew word for a blessing. A blessing in Hebrew is a bracha, and a pool of water is a brecha. And there you see the link between the notion that blessing is in some way related to life-giving, life-sustaining essence, which in the desert world is water. Once again, you see on the screen right now the word for a blessing in Hebrew, and the word is bracha, from the root bet resh chaf. You can see here a picture of a girl being blessed. 
And what I hope happens is that you imagine in your mind a sense of blessing, any picture in your mind you want, any time you hear the word bracha. And now take a look at this word on the screen, which comes from the root bet resh chaf. Can you read this two vowel and therefore two syllable word? The first syllable is ba mitsuyan. Remember, we would not add the resh to the first syllable because there's no silent shva under it. Every letter begins a new Hebrew syllable unless it has a silent shva. So the first syllable is simply ba, and the second syllable is ruch mitsuyan. Put the word together, baruch or baruch. And remember, it comes from the root bet resh chaf. This happens to be the past participle of this root, and therefore it's translated in English as blessed. Blessed. And now look at these two words together. Can you read these two words together? If you said ata baruch, you are 100% correct. Ata Baruch. You know the word Ata means you. You know the word Baruch means blessed. Ata Baruch means you are blessed. There are no words in Hebrew for is or are, the present tense of the verb to be in Hebrew, and therefore we simply add those words for the English idiom. Ata Baruch is you are blessed. And now you know the word Baruch comes from this idea of life-giving water. And therefore the Hebrew is more than simply you are blessed. Rather it is you, referring to God in a minute, we'll talk about that. You are the source of that which sustains all of us in the wilderness, in the desert, as if you are the water-saving, water-giving life to all humanity. Ata Baruch, you are blessed. And it turns out that in Hebrew, the syntax of Hebrew sentences is often to begin not with the pronoun, as is true in English, but with the verb. And therefore, in Hebrew it is written, Baruch Ata. It means the exact same thing as Ata Baruch. Baruch Ata still is you are blessed, although we tend to translate it in prayer books as blessed are you or blessed art thou. But you now understand that Baruch Atah has a more powerful meaning. It is the way every Jewish blessing begins, Baruch Atah, and then a third word, Adonai. And you remember from our last lesson, the double Yud, is simply the abbreviation of God's proper name. And therefore, Baruch Ata, you are the life-giving source, Adonai, which again is the abbreviation of our God's proper name. You, Adonai, are the source of all life. And what follows is a description of Adonai, and then whatever the blessing requires of us to do. And again, when we continue next time, we'll finish the introduction to the short form blessing and then actually add to it one of the most important blessings that a young person learns and which is recited all the time in the Jewish tradition, the bore, the blessing that is said any time one lifts a cup of wine and blesses the wine in the cup the fruit of the vine, the Bore Prihagafen. But that's for our next lesson. For now, I want to remind you that you can always find information about From the Aleph Bet on our website, www.shalomtv.com. And please remember, I love hearing from you at Rabbi Golub at shalomtv.com. Also, if there are any of you watching who wish to support Shalom TV and From the Aleph Bet, if you make a tax-deductible contribution of $18 or more, of chai or more, of life, 
we'll be honored to send you a complimentary DVD of this edition, this lesson of From the Aleph Bet, together with our last lesson, which was the, the name of God, and the lesson we're going to do next time, which completes the Bore as a blessing. Tax-deductible contributions should be made out to Jewish Education in Media, the nonprofit organization that produces From the Aleph Bet, Shalom TV, and mail to Shalom TV, Post Office Box 1989, Fort Lee, New Jersey, 07024. And so until the next time, for all of us who help bring you from the Aleph Bet, I'm Mark Golub. Be well, my friends. Lehitraot.